Southern Fried True Crime covers cases that may not be suitable for all listeners, and there may also be some explicit language used. Listener discretion is advised. Thanksgiving is supposed to be a time of gathering with family and friends, celebrating your relationships and giving thanks for the many blessings in our lives. But what if you've been cut off from your family and friends? What if all you have is someone who hits you, belittles you, has isolated you from everyone and everything you love? What would that day mean to you? I doubt it would still be a day of celebration. For Ashley Scott, it would be her final day on this earth. And the night before, when other women are scurrying around, preparing dishes to share with their loved ones, Ashley was desperately trying to run away from the monster in her life, and ultimately taking her final beating. This is the story of Ashley Pittman Scott, beloved teacher, daughter, sister, and friend, whose life slipped away from her while she was lying battered, cold, and alone on her own garage floor. On Thanksgiving Day, November 23, 2006, Memphis, Tennessee 911 dispatcher Paula Haygood received a call from a man named Jeffrey Scott. She would later testify that she quickly alerted her supervisor that she had a possible homicide call. Not from what Jeffrey Scott was reporting, but from someone else she heard in the background. Jeff Scott was calmly explaining that his wife was unconscious and could not be roused, but that she was still breathing. But Paula Haygood heard a man in the background say, No, no, she's not breathing. She's dead. Memphis police officer Sloan Liddell was the first to respond to the Scots' home. When he walked into the bedroom, he saw a man giving a woman on the floor CPR. The man was Dr. Robert McGee, a friend of Jeffrey Scott's. He was the man the 911 dispatcher had heard in the background of the call. Jeff had called and asked him to come and check on Ashley, who he was, quote, concerned about. Dr. McGee hesitated. This was Thanksgiving, after all, and he was in the car with his family returning home when Jeff called. He asked Jeff if the two had been drinking, and Jeff said that they had, and again insisted Dr. McGee come and check on Ashley. He would later testify that Jeffrey Scott did not sound concerned or panicked, but he did ask that Dr. McGee come alone. The doctor thought the couple had been drinking and fighting and didn't want his family involved so he dropped them off at home and arrived an hour later at the Scott household. Now that he was there, he was sorry he hadn't rushed over. As soon as he saw Ashley Scott, he knew right away she was dying, if not dead already, and insisted Jeff call 911. Officer Liddell said he could tell immediately that Ashley Scott had been severely beaten, and he detained Jeffrey Scott in his police car. Jeff told him he had argued with his wife about a text message he found on her phone. The officer went on to cordon off the scene and later testified to what he saw. Ashley's phone, passport, and purse were sitting on the table in the kitchen, and a printed-out page of what looked to be an email was lying next to a laptop. And in the garage, he saw two cars, Jeffrey Scott's Jeep Wrangler and Ashley's Volkswagen Bug. Inside her car, there were clothes thrown in the back, still on hangers. On the floor beside her car was a pillow and blanket, and what looked like bloodstains. Gary Garman was a paramedic with the fire department, and he was the first medical responder on the scene. He immediately saw that Ashley had blunt force trauma to the head, and after her clothing was cut away, he saw trauma to her legs, chest, and back. She had no pulse or blood pressure. Her pupils were dilated and non-responsive, and there was bloody vomit coming from her mouth and nose. Garmin said she had raccoon eyes and what he called battle signs, bruising behind the ears consistent with severe head trauma. 
He also noticed that Ashley had cauliflower ear, which the ER nurses and doctors later confirmed, an injury usually associated with boxers who take repeated direct hits to the ear. He also noted a large bruise on her back that appeared to be a shoe print. He and another EMT used a defibrillator to shock Ashley four times and also administered various medications to restart her heart. When this didn't work, they intubated her and continued CPR and immediately transported her to Baptist Memorial Hospital. Michelle Ann Bow, an ER nurse at the hospital, later testified that Ashley Scott arrived in critical condition with a very faint pulse and minimal blood pressure. Dr. Miguel Rodriguez, the emergency room doctor on duty, concurred with the first responders that the bruising all over Ashley's body was consistent with a severe beating, and in his experience, the bruises in differing shades of healing showed a pattern of abuse. He also agreed that the bruise on Ashley's back looked like a shoe print, and noted that another bruise on her side looked like it was from the toe of a boot. Dr. Michael Smith, a critical care physician at BMH, agreed with Dr. Rodriguez, later testifying that on first seeing Ashley, she looked like she had, quote, been beaten to death. And on further examination, he found bruises in different stages of aging all over her battered body. He found bruises on both arms, legs, knees, back, chest, her ears, and her face. And in consultation with Dr. Rodriguez, who was also a neurosurgeon, they found that Ashley had suffered a massive head trauma and was brain dead. She was already in the third stage of shock, her organs shutting down, and there was nothing that could be done. She was taken off the ventilator and died almost immediately, and Jeffrey Scott was charged with first-degree murder. The autopsy of Ashley Scott would find more than 50 bruises and contusions covering her entire body. Her cause of death was a subdural hematoma to the right side of her brain, the swelling of which caused massive hemorrhaging and cut off oxygen to the rest of her body, causing cardiac arrest and the gradual shutdown of the rest of her organs. In more layman terms, she had been hit so hard on the left side of her head that her brain had crashed into the right side of her skull, causing the bleeding and swelling, which then cut off the flow of oxygen to the rest of her major organs. But had she received immediate medical attention, she would have lived. Later, under questioning, Jeff Scott would admit he didn't call his friend for help for more than 13 hours after what he characterized as an argument. After this so-called argument, he claimed he forced his wife to sleep in the garage, giving her a pillow and blanket, and going back to their warm bed alone, leaving Ashley Scott battered, cold, and hemorrhaging on their garage floor. Memphis, Tennessee, founded in 1819, was named for the ancient capital of Egypt on the Nile River. It first developed as a trade and transportation center in the 19th century because of its flood-free location high above the Mississippi River. Located in the low-lying delta region along the river, in the southwestern corner of Tennessee, Memphis is famous for the influential strains of blues, soul, and rock and roll that originated there. Aretha Franklin was born there. Elvis Presley, B.B. King, and Johnny Cash all recorded albums at the legendary Sun Studio, and people came from all over the world to visit Graceland, the legendary home of Elvis Presley. Other music landmarks include the Rock and Soul Museum, the Blues Hall of Fame, and the Stax Museum of American Soul Music. Music isn't the only contribution Memphis has made to American culture. It was also the epicenter of the Civil Rights Movement culminating with the Reverend Martin Luther King's assassination there in 1968, and modern Memphis still has racial tensions. African Americans are the majority at almost 63% of citizens, but the total metropolitan area has a higher proportion of whites and a higher per capita income than the population of the city. Like many metropolitan southern cities, money is the great racial divide. Jeffrey and Ashley Scott sat somewhere in the middle of these demographics. He worked at his dad's tech firm, and she was a beloved high school teacher, teaching creative writing at Bolton High School in Arlington, Tennessee, about 30 miles from Memphis. 
Ashley, an enthusiastic and passionate young teacher, at 28 years old, was a favorite with students and faculty alike. Ashley was born on November 4, 1978, in Bossier City, Louisiana, to Mai and Dennis Youngblood. After their divorce, she was adopted by her stepfather, Jimmy Wayne Pittman, when she was still in kindergarten. But despite the divorce of her parents, from all accounts, Ashley had a normal, happy childhood. A vivacious and popular blonde beauty, she graduated from Parkway High School in 1996. Her best friend, Lori Machen, said, She loved people. She would just instantly make friends with anyone, and she was really, really funny. She met Jeffrey Scott at Washita Baptist University in Arkansas, where she graduated with a teaching degree in the year 2000. From the start, the couple was inseparable. Family and friends didn't really worry at first. They were so in love, and we all know how all-consuming young love can be. But then she moved to Cordova, Tennessee, and married Jeffrey Scott, without inviting her own family to the wedding. By then, friends and family had already become concerned. They didn't like Jeff. Something about his offhand deprecating remarks. The way he had to know where she was at all times. It was beyond controlling. It was obsessive. And he openly disliked her family and disapproved of her friends. Cordova, Tennessee, lies east of Memphis, north of Germantown, and the majority of Cordova has been annexed by the city of Memphis. The small town is really more of a neighborhood of Memphis than a suburb, with its many businesses, Galleria Mall, and the Hope Presbyterian megachurch that boasts a weekly attendance of almost 8,000. Cordova is sort of a small town Memphis, but like Arlington, it's all considered Shelby County and within the Shelby County School District. Ashley Scott got her start teaching in 2003 at Collierville High School in another suburb of Memphis as a student teacher to Elizabeth Sism, who later penned an essay published in Memphis Magazine titled Drop Dead Gorgeous about her favorite student. She fondly remembered the first time she met the tanned blonde and flip-flops with a tattooed bracelet around her right ankle. Ashley's first assignment was to teach the Crucible about the Salem Witch Trials, and Elizabeth said she jumped in with gusto, nearly cursing with passion, until Elizabeth raised a genteel eyebrow her way. Ashley quickly replaced the word ass with ear, and so began a playful mentor-student relationship that lasted until Ashley's death. Ashley nicknamed Elizabeth Yoda, and she referred to Ashley as Luke Skywalker from then on. Elizabeth described Ashley as a magnetic young woman with a photographic memory who would quote Winston Churchill and lyrics of the Black Eyed Peas in the same breath. Her students were enthralled with the lovely young woman, and Ashley loved being in the classroom. She said Ashley told her that teaching was the only job she'd ever done well, saying that the classroom was where she felt most like herself, and when she was teaching, she felt like she was doing exactly what she was meant to do. In 2003, when she was student teaching, she was already married to Jeffrey Scott and had cut off ties with her family. The family never explained this much in interviews insisting there was no riff, but that it was just Ashley's decision, that she had wanted to start a new life and felt it was what she needed to do as an adult. But her sister, Keisha Vakovius, later lamented that everything was good until she met him. He had some sort of control over her mind. Isolating their victim from friends and family is an all-too-common tactic used by domestic abusers. It's often stage one in tearing down the victim's self-esteem. It's harder to convince them they are worthless when they still have a strong support system. Her best friend, Lori Machen, later testified to Jeffrey Scott's controlling behavior at his trial. She and Ashley had been friends since the fifth grade, and she was one of the only people Ashley kept in touch with during her marriage to Jeff Scott. The murder trial of Jeffrey Scott started on January 13, 2009, and lasted for eight days. On the stand, Lori Machen recalled that in November of 2005, Jeff began calling her himself, complaining about Ashley. He told Lori that Ashley was drinking a lot, falling down and getting hurt and not remembering how the next morning. He told her that Ashley was spending too much time with a friend named Blair Brown, who he considered to be a bad influence. We will get to Miss Brown in a minute. 
What is important here is that Jeff seemed to be trying to get in Lori's head that Ashley was not only a heavy drinker, but one that fell a lot, possibly getting bruises that couldn't be explained. He denigrated Ashley's character, said she had multiple affairs, and was hell-bent on portraying himself as the victim. The man who wanted to have children, but told Lori with disgust that he no longer wanted Ashley to be the mother of his children. Lori was understandably bewildered by these phone calls and tried calling Ashley repeatedly, but Ashley would never pick up. She told Jeff every time he called that it was really useless. She was Ashley's best friend and always would be, and would therefore always be biased and was probably not the best person for Jeffrey to confide in. Finally, Jeff called her for the last time and said that the couple was in therapy and that their therapist told him he should leave Lori out of their problems and he promised not to contact her again. After that, Ashley began taking her calls again and opening up to her about the state of her marriage. She told her of how Jeff constantly belittled her, telling her that being such a whore made her a terrible role model and not fit for teaching. But she stopped short of telling her old friend of the physical abuse she was suffering. Lori did know that Ashley drank a lot, but she wanted to be her friend and not alienate her. She last saw Ashley in September of 2006, when she came to stay with her so they could go to their high school reunion. She recalled shopping with Ashley, who refused to spend much money, saying that Jeffrey would kill her. She also said that Jeff called Ashley incessantly on this trip, even on their way to the reunion, asking Ashley what she was wearing and making her describe it to him in detail. Lori tried to talk to Ashley about her marriage, but Ashley insisted she was having a good time and didn't want to ruin it by talking about Jeff. This was just two months before her death. On the weekend before Thanksgiving, the Memphis International Jazz Festival is held in the South Main Historic Arts District in downtown Memphis. Late Wednesday afternoon of that short school week, as other teachers and women everywhere were preparing for the day of feast, Ashley Scott made a frantic call to her divorce lawyer, Rachel Songstad, a woman she'd been in touch with for more than a year. A woman who saw her, saw what was happening, and tried her best to help. In the end, the only cold comfort she could provide was her respected testimony at Jeffrey Scott's trial. She said a mutual friend had given Ashley her number so that she could refer her to a criminal lawyer for a DUI she'd been charged with. When Ashley found out she was a divorce lawyer, she asked Miss Songstad for advice for a friend who was being abused. She told Ashley that her friend should leave immediately, and of course, she was already suspicious that there was no friend. Ashley was convicted of driving under the influence in August of 2005. She confided in Elizabeth Sism that she'd been at a bar drinking with Jeffrey, who had suddenly turned on her, said she was acting like a whore, and insisted she go home. So she got up and left, and was pulled over and got the DUI on her way home. Attorney Rachel Songstad saw her again in October of 2005, and Ashley had a knot on the side of her head. She asked Ashley if she was really the friend that she'd been telling her about, and that if she told her as her attorney, their conversation would be protected by attorney-client privilege. Ashley said she didn't have the money to hire her, and Miss Songstad told her a dollar would be enough to retain her services right then and there. Ashley gave her four quarters and quietly nodded that she was indeed the victim of abuse. Miss Songstad advised her to leave Jeff and gave her several options of what to do. And Ashley told her if she ever tried to leave Jeff, he would kill her. She also told her that he had been hitting her since college. Between this meeting in October of 2005, and Ashley's death just a little over a year later, Rachel Songstad saw and spoke with Ashley on numerous occasions. She often had to meet in person and said Ashley only called her from pay phones or business numbers because Jeff constantly checked her cell phone for numbers he didn't know. She once called her from a tanning salon and Miss Songstad went to meet her there in the parking lot. Ashley had a bandage on her chin and told Songstad that Jeff had knocked her down and then kicked her causing her to collide with a piece of furniture which busted open her chin. Elizabeth Sism, Ashley's former teacher and close friend, also testified that she often saw Ashley with black eyes and other bruises. In September of 2006, after Ashley's high school reunion, she met with her at Bolton High School where she taught, 
and Ashley told her the most harrowing story yet. When she got home from her class reunion, Jeff told her he'd had a prostitute in the house, and then proceeded to go through her suitcase the whole time screaming at her that she dressed like a whore. When Ashley responded with something like, well, maybe if I did dress like a whore, you wouldn't be having prostitutes in the house. Jeff knocked her down and held his foot on her throat. When she begged him to stop because she couldn't breathe, he told her he didn't want her to breathe. Elizabeth said Ashley told her he constantly called her names, hit her, and that she was depressed, hurt, and frustrated. She also admitted to her drinking problems, confessing to her friend and mentor that she did not go a day without drinking and usually did not remember going to bed. Still trying to protect her favorite student and friend, she only admitted the part about Ashley's drinking on cross-examination. But she wasn't the only friend they called to report on Ashley's increasingly alarming behavior leading up to the murder. Paul Dooley, a colleague at Bolton High School where Ashley taught, also testified. He was her department chair and described himself also as a mentor and friend. He too knew about the DUI conviction and a lot of Ashley's secrets, so his testimony really added to the mounting evidence of abuse Ashley was suffering in her marriage. He said she began by just complaining about verbal and emotional abuse in the fall of 2005 after her DUI, but soon she couldn't hide how serious things were getting. She was missing too much work and showing up with obvious bruises even though she tried to hide it with heavy makeup. Many of Ashley's students later told reporters the same stories of seeing Ashley in heavy makeup and always wearing long sleeves, even when it was hot out. When makeup wouldn't cover her bruises, she would laugh it off to her young students, saying she had walked into a cabinet or something. Paul Dooley testified that he was growing more and more concerned for Ashley in mid-2006. She called him at 3.15 a.m. one morning in July, crying and saying that she and Jeff had had an awful fight and that he had hit her and strangled her. Like everyone else in her life that she confided in, Paul tried to talk her into leaving, into calling the cops, to do something about how dangerous her marriage was becoming. But she never would. And she'd usually try to minimize the fights when he would bring them up again later. Two other teachers, as well as Ashley's principal and boss at Bolton High School, were called by the prosecution at Jeffrey Scott's trial and they told similar stories of seeing Ashley with bruises, long sleeves, and of her change in demeanor in the months leading up to her death. Where Ashley had always been an outgoing and cheerful teacher as well as colleague, she had become withdrawn and melancholy. Any attempts to draw her out were usually met with polite denial. She only confided in a few close friends about her real life. Rachel Songstad was her attorney but she was also a friend that cared about Ashley, and she gave some of the best and most heartbreaking evidence at the trial. Ashley had also told her about the attack after her class reunion when Jeff had stepped on her throat. The final part of Miss Songstad's testimony is when she told the court that Ashley called her late on the afternoon of November 22nd, the day before her murder, and told her she had the filing fee for the divorce. Miss Songstad told her she was in Nashville, and couldn't meet with her right away, but that she should go ahead and get out now. Ashley said she needed to get some things from the house and asked her if she should tell Jeff she was leaving. Miss Songstad strongly advised her not to tell him and to just leave, but Ashley said she felt like she owed an explanation to him and his family about why she was leaving. As we know, Ashley had hastily thrown some clothes still on hangers in the back of her car, moved the pet crate, possibly trying to load it in her car, and even had her passport out with her purse. It's obvious she was trying to leave, and now it's obvious that Jeff had no intention of letting her. But for someone who didn't want to let go of his wife, he also had no trouble cheating on her. Though he often complained about Ashley's numerous affairs, there was only one proven in court, which I will get into in a bit. But Jeff himself had a long-term affair during their marriage. A woman named Virginia Blair Brown was called to the stand during the trial. This is the same Blair Brown that Jeff told Lori Machen, Ashley's best friend, was a bad influence on his wife when he was making those weird phone calls to Lori in November of 2005. Turns out, Blair Brown worked with Jeff at his dad's company. 
She started there in March of the year 2000, less than a year before Jeff and Ashley were married. She testified that she began a sexual relationship with Jeffrey Scott that was on and off from December of 2002 until the middle of 2005, which would be just a couple of months before Ashley's DUI. It was around then she became, according to her testimony, very good friends with Ashley. She said Jeff told Ashley about their relationship after the affair had ended, and unbelievably, the two had become friends. Blair said that Ashley often came over to her house to get away from Jeff when they had been fighting. She testified that both of them drank heavily, and while she had seen Ashley angry, she'd never seen her in a rage at her husband. But she had actually witnessed an enraged Jeff assaulting Ashley. It was one of the times she'd come over seeking refuge. Jeff came barging in, and before they knew what was happening, he came into the room where Ashley was lying on the bed and punched her really fast three times in the back. She said she got Jeff off of Ashley and kicked him out of her house, but said that Ashley insisted she didn't want to call the police. She also recalled an ugly incident with Jeff and Ashley's dog. Jeff had been driving his Jeep, with Ashley and the dog in the passenger side. He grabbed the dog and threw it out on the road. Ashley called her almost hysterical, and she met them both at the veterinarian's office. The dog was injured and took a couple of weeks to recover, but did live. This incident was not further elaborated on at trial, but one of Ashley's students did speak of the incident. She said Ashley insisted it was an accident. And this is in keeping with Ashley's habit of minimizing Jeffrey Scott's abuse after others would find out. It's also in keeping with what we know about abusers, that they often target the pets of their victims as another way of controlling them. Blair Brown also testified about being with Ashley at a bar when she met a man named Michael Lowe. She claimed she knew that Ashley and Michael Lowe had an affair for about a year, but there is no proof they had a long-term relationship. On cross-examination by the defense, she admitted that Mr. Lowe had come to her house with Ashley and they'd had sex in her guest bedroom. She also admitted that she called Jeff Scott and told him what was going on. She defended her actions by saying at this point she felt that Ashley was using her and was frustrated, and that's why she called Jeff. As dubious as I feel towards Blair Brown, her relationship to both Ashley and Jeff, and her admitted vindictiveness, her story for the most part rings true. She said terrible things about both of the Scots, and admitted to being a pretty shitty friend herself. But of course, her testimony opened the door to Michael Lowe being called to the stand. Mr. Lowe minimized his relationship with Ashley, saying it was not a full-blown affair, but admitting that they had had sex on four occasions. Jeff Scott's defense attorney, Leslie Ballin, subpoenaed a technician from AT&T to go over Ashley's cell phone records, trying to prove the affair was more serious. This was over 10 years ago, and the technology wasn't what it is today, so they didn't have actual transcripts of the text. But they were able to prove the number and type of text message. Multimedia texts were more than likely pictures. On cross-examination, the technician said that almost all of the text messages on Ashley Scott's account from October 29, 2006, up to the night of her murder on November 22, 2006, were between Ashley and Michael Lowe and that five multimedia or picture texts were sent to Michael Lowe on November 22nd. Though the technician could not testify to the nature of these pictures, Sheriff's Deputy Steve Beerbrot testified to what was found on Ashley's phone. There were five pictures of female genitalia sent to Mr. Lowe on November 22nd. And now we know what text message Jeffrey Scott was referring to when he said he and his wife had argued that night. But I don't believe Ashley started the day before Thanksgiving planning to leave her husband. No one does. Not only was she really good at hiding the danger she was in, she was also in deep denial herself, still actually trying to save her marriage. At trial, Ashley's gynecologist testified that he saw her on November 14th. She was there to get on medication to increase her ovulation because she and Jeff were getting serious about having a baby. Defense attorney Leslie Ballin also called local realtor Lisa Harris to the stand, who confirmed that the couple had recently bought a new home, signing the contract on the 14th, 
the same day Ashley went to see her doctor for help in getting pregnant. And Blair Brown testified to seeing Ashley on November 22nd, the day before Thanksgiving, the day before her death. She had taken Miss Brown to see the new house, and then the pair had gone to lunch. She said Ashley had several glasses of wine and was in good spirits, happy about her new home, and excited that she and Jeff were finally going to try for a baby. What makes all of this so hard to understand is that we also know she was still texting Michael Lowe, indeed up until that day. Jeffrey Scott's lawyer did a great job laying the groundwork for second-degree murder as opposed to first-degree. Here we have Jeff Scott, who'd recently bought a new home and was willing to try and have a baby in order to save his marriage, and Ashley Scott, who was still texting the other man. It's easy to paint the picture of the wronged husband who snapped. The prosecutor, Karen Cook, valiantly tried to keep Michael Lowe off the stand. She also tried to keep the printed email I mentioned in the beginning of the episode out of the trial, too. As I mentioned, along with the other evidence photographed after the murder that would indicate Ashley was leaving, there was a printed-out email from Ashley's personal account. The email was to her biological father, David Youngblood. In the email, Ashley thanks her father for a check he had sent and talks of the couple's financial troubles. She listed her monthly income and expenses, and the email seemed to be about Ashley's father helping her and teaching her how to budget her money. Only part of the long email was put into evidence, and that part read, Jeffrey would be mad at me if I asked for money, and I am so pig-headed that I would rather run up a bill and ask him for money. Please don't think less of me. I just need a strict payment regimen, and I refuse to let Jeffrey put me on a budget. But I will let my pops love you Thanks again, me. It's easy to see why the prosecutor tried to keep this out of the trial. Once again, it paints Ashley in a bad light. Not only was she cheating on her husband, but she was irresponsible with their finances and refused to work together with him on a budget. But I see this email differently. Financial control is yet another tactic an abuser uses to maintain dominance over the victim. Ashley would have been scared to ask Jeff for money, and she also would have still been trying to keep the abuse a secret from her family. So she takes the blame in the email she sends to her father, thanking him for the check he sent. She did that a lot, taking the blame, minimizing Jeff's responsibility. It's hard for us to understand how someone could put up with the abuse she did, but maybe she did blame herself. That's not uncommon either. And I believed Michael Lowe's testimony when he refused to characterize the relationship as a full-blown affair. Not only did he seem credible on the stand, the defense proved by insisting on including the cell phone records that this was a recent development in Ashley's life. They may have met earlier in the year, as Blair Brown claimed, but they did not have sex until about a month before Ashley's death. I think Ashley was trying to save her marriage or at least had committed to try and save it to Jeffrey Scott. But she felt conflicted about this decision. Maybe she reached out to Michael Lowe to undermine what she knew in her heart was the wrong decision to stay in her dangerous marriage. On the same day, she was showing off her new house, having lunch with a friend, and gushing about making babies with her husband. She also sent five graphic photos of herself to Michael Lowe. This makes no sense unless you consider how scared and confused she must have been. She had just gone on medication to help her get pregnant and signed a contract on a new house with a man who beat her so severely she often had to wear heavy makeup or miss work altogether due to her injuries. She had to have felt conflicted about these decisions. I'm sure he promised her these new beginnings would change things, but she was still drinking heavily, a sign of self-medication, and reaching out desperately to another man in the eleventh hour. She also made a final desperate call to her lawyer, Rachel Songstad, saying she was ready to file for divorce. I think, after lunch with Blair Brown, Ashley came home to her husband, and they began drinking together. Maybe she did come home to ask him for the divorce, but maybe she had changed her mind again but I think at some point he showed her the printed email he had found by snooping on her laptop. 
Then he asked her for her phone, or maybe he snatched it away from her. And then the beating began. I think she realized too late that she'd made a mistake. Her shoes were found in two different places. Her clothes thrown haphazardly in her car. Her closet, usually kept so neat, was a mess. The dog crate had been moved. I think she was desperately trying to run, and he kept hitting her and hitting her until she went down in the garage. Jeffrey Scott told police that they had had an argument over a text message that just got out of hand, and that he had made his wife go lay down to sleep in the garage around 1 a.m. He said at around 9 a.m. he went and got her from the garage and put her in front of the fireplace. Then he said around noon he had tried to move her to their bed, but was unable to get her on the bed, so he left her there on the floor. This is where his friend, Dr. Robert McGee, found Ashley almost six hours later. McGee testified that her bare feet and hands were a sickly bluish color. And through all of this, Jeffrey Scott insisted he didn't realize she was that injured. Bullshit. He knew. He knew the minute she hit the floor in the garage. He just didn't care. After kicking her a couple more times for good measure, he then just went to bed and left her there. The blunt trauma from his kicks in the shoe print were evident to first responders, the hospital staff, and in the photos from her autopsy. Then, when he woke up, he made a plan. He put the pillow and blanket there later as a cover story. I think he brought her in by the fire to try and warm her up before he called Robert McGee. She was still alive when he brought her in from the garage, though she was probably already brain dead. No amount of defibrillators or shots to the heart would have brought her back if she had been dead long when the paramedics got there after 6 p.m. that night, and they were able to get a faint pulse going. So why else would he wait? If she was dead when he went out there that morning, wouldn't he have put all of this into place then? He waited until she stopped breathing to call Dr. McGee. Robert McGee testified that the call even started out conversationally, like, How are you doing, buddy? Have a nice Thanksgiving? Yeah, could you come by here and check on Ashley? She's had a bit to drink and won't come to, and I'm a little concerned. Ashley's stepfather later said the 911 call sounded like a man ordering breakfast. He was cold, calculated, and the only question he asked one of the officers at the station after his wife was taken to the hospital, was who had won the football game. He never gave a damn, and he knew she was dead. Unfortunately, at Jeffrey Scott's trial, Ashley Scott's character was also on trial. His defense attorney, Leslie Ballas, made sure of it. He tried to prove the theory that Ashley could have suffered from alcoholic ketoacidosis and that this condition caused her to have seizures and fall down, causing all of these injuries. And that's why Jeff didn't think she was that hurt. She only fell a couple of times. He even found an expert witness named Dr. O'Brien Cleary Smith, who testified to the possibility of this preposterous argument. This theory was shot down on rebuttal by the expert testimony of Dr. Lisa Funte the assistant medical examiner of Shelby County, who listed in graphic detail all of the over 50 bruises and contusions all over Ashley Scott's body, along with the blunt force trauma injuries to her head. Dr. Funte was backed up by Shelby County's chief medical examiner, Dr. Karen Chancellor, who went over the very graphic autopsy photos again for the jury and explained that those injuries could not have been from a couple of falls. The only reasonable cause of death was the severe brain injury Ashley Scott suffered from the vicious beating at the hands of her husband. But, after only a few hours, the jury came back with a verdict. They found Jeffrey Scott guilty of second-degree murder. This was a verdict that disgusted everyone. Even the judge criticized the jury, saying, Sometime in the morning he could have called for help and he didn't. He knew he had committed an atrocity. He knew his wife was still breathing, and yet he did nothing. In my opinion, there was proof of murder in the first degree. I think the jury gave Mr. Scott an unbelievable break. This was a violent and atrocious crime. I agree. So do many others. 
Ashley's family, friends, and students mourned her loss deeply. Several students attended the trial, sitting behind her family. At prom the following spring, the theme was pink, for Ashley's favorite color. They wore pink dresses, pink boas, pink ties and pink cummerbunds, even pink sneakers. They refused to forget their beloved teacher even to this day. One of her students was the person who reached out to me, asking me to tell Ashley's story. Paul Dooley, her friend and colleague, organizes an annual 5K run for Ashley every year in October. The money raised goes to the Abused Women's Services of Memphis and Shelby County. Research from the National Domestic Abuse Hotline shows that victims who experience some form of strangulation during their abuse are ten times more likely to eventually be killed by their abuser. Ashley had confided in at least three different people in her life that she had been strangled by Jeffrey Scott, her attorney Rachel Songstad, her colleague Paul Dooley, and her mentor and friend Elizabeth Sism. I am in no way blaming them for this tragedy. Ashley herself often downplayed the incidents later and always refused to call the police. But if pointing this out and telling Ashley's story helps even one person, it's worth it to me. Unfortunately, Ashley's case has all the warning signs. Along with the severe beatings, he controlled the money. He criticized her looks and dictated her wardrobe. He demeaned her, often calling her a whore. He isolated her from her friends and family. He terrorized her by abusing her pet. All of these are classic techniques used by abusers to maintain dominance over their victims. Sometimes, it is hard to see these things from the outside looking in. But at the very least, please don't look away. Southern Fried True Crime is written and produced by me, Erica Kelly. The original graphic art is by Coley Horner, and Southern Fried's original music is by Rob Harrison of Gamma Radio. If you like the show, please tell a friend or rate and review on iTunes. I am also on Google Play and Stitcher and many other podcast platforms. If you're interested in supporting the show, I am now on Patreon. If you have any comments, corrections, or suggestions, you can email me at southernfriedtruecrime at gmail.com. I'm on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Just search for Southern Fried True Crime if you'd like to connect with me there. I won't be releasing an episode the week of Thanksgiving, but I wanted to let you all know how thankful I am to have you listening. I am humbled by the response my show has already received and so grateful that cases like Ashley's are being heard. This was actually a listener suggestion, and when she wrote me, she said she knew it was, quote, just another domestic violence case and that I might not be interested, which only made me want to tell Ashley's story even more. If you or anyone you know are in danger from an abuser, please call 1-800-799-7233, the National Domestic Violence Hotline for support. I will put this number and other hotlines around the world in my show notes. Thanks so much for listening. Y'all take care.